Good afternoon and uh, you're welcome. Delighted to uh, see you all. Well, I can't see too many of you, but know that you're all here and uh, joining us for this IIEA webinar. My name is Alex White. I'm Director General of the IIEA and we're really delighted uh, to be joined uh, this afternoon uh, by Bill Nordhouse. Nobel Laureate in Economic Sciences 2018 and Sterling Professor of Economics at Yale University. In 2013, Bill North has published his acclaimed book, The Climate Casino. And in that book, uh, Professor North has argued that the world has entered the climate casino and, ro we're, and that we're you know, rolling the global warming dice uh, in the absence of effective policies to tackle climate change. A decade on from uh, that book's release and following his important recent research on the Climate Club and the release of his 2021 book, The Spirit of Green, Professor Nordhaus is going to consider whether the world still has an opportunity. And what a day to be thinking about this and talking about it. He's actually going to ask, does the world still have an opportunity to exit the climate casino and implement policies that will reverse the tide of global warming? Uh, so this lecture today um, forms part of the Environmental Resilience uh, Lecture Series, co-organized by ourselves at the Institute here and the Environmental Protection Agency, the EPA. And in that context, I am delighted to invite, um, in the first instance, before we go to Bill, to invite Andy Fanning, who's Program Manager for Environment and Health at the EPA, uh, to provide a few words of introduction on behalf of the EPA. So Andy, over to you. Thanks, Alex. Really appreciate the, the introduction. And just to reiterate for myself, on behalf of the EPA, we just have to be very thankful to Professor Nordhaus for, for coming here today. It's a really important area of research. Um, from an EPA perspective, I suppose, we, we recognize that, that the three challenges of sustainability across societal, economic, and environmental. And while the EPA focuses primarily on the environmental one, we recognize that we can't affect change without engaging with both, uh, both the economy and with society to, to, to affect change. So for us to be involved and to hear and to continue to learn from, from, from our colleagues in other fields is, is, is a great pleasure and a great privilege. I suppose you mentioned, as you say, when we come to climate change and Professor Nordhaus, your, your work on climate change, we're recognizing this, the narrowing timeframes for action and they're getting tighter and tighter and the need for more intense action is growing year on year. So with that in mind, um, learning on how we might lever some additional activity and action to, to address the climate issues are, are, is always a valuable one for ourselves. Um, I think how, looking across, across the, the, the swathe of work that you've done over, over a number of decades and substantially uh, the amount of work that you've done looking from the global commons from an environmental scientist that the tragedy of the commons is a key issue for ourselves and uh, we recognize that some of the, these uh, link ups along the way and the work you've done on carbon pricing and and the climate club i suppose is the one that i'm most uh, most interested in but having seen this on behalf of the ep i have to recognize that uh, we are sitting here to learn today. Uh, I have the responsibility of producing next day of the environment report. So I always want to learn from new uh, new facets and new perspectives that will help us to get there. So I'll pass it back to, to Alex and again reiterate our thanks as an environmental protection agency to you for taking the time to be here today. Thanks a million, Andy. Um, so just so our um, attendees know, uh, Professor Nordhaus is going to speak to us for maybe about 20 minutes or so, and then we'll have a Q&A, as is our norm. And you can join that discussion, uh, ask a question by using the Q&A function in Zoom that everybody's very familiar with at this stage. And you can send in your questions at any stage. And we also encourage people, to, if you, a question occurs to you, just maybe send, type it up and send it in immediately rather than waiting until uh, at the end of, of the talk. And we'll get to those questions um, as soon as um, Bill has finished his presentation. You can also participate um, on X, as it's now called, if you like, and use the handle at IIEA if you're that way motivated. And just to remind everybody that the the presentation and the Q&A today are both uh, on the record. William Nordhaus is Sterling Professor of Economics at Yale. His major work focuses on the economics of climate change, developing models that integrate the science, economics, and policies necessary to slow global warming. 
He was awarded the Nobel Prize in Economic Sciences in 2018, quote, for integrating climate change into long run macroeconomic analysis, end quote. From 1977 to 1979, Professor North has served as a member of President Carter's Council of Economic Advisors. From 86 to 88, he served as the provost of Yale and was president of the American Economic Association from 2015 to 2016. Professor North has completed his undergraduate work at Yale in 1963 and received his PhD in economics in 1967 from the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, MIT. Bill North has, it's a great pleasure for us to have you with us this afternoon. And it's um, at my uh, honor to hand the virtual floor to you now for your presentation. You're very welcome. Thank you very much. It's great to be with you. Um, as I as I was coming here, I said I'll, to my wife, I'll see you later. I'm going to Dublin. And she said, can I go with you? <laughs> and it's, I'd say it's, it's, a, it's a very low carbon way to talk to you, although not nearly as pleasant as actually being with you in person and on site. So uh, I have a few slides if we can put them up uh, and um, you can, so uh, the, the title is a no exit on climate change question mark. And uh, I'll really, I don't have an answer to that, but I'll discuss with you some of the questions. So for the next slide, we'll show you the key issues I want to talk about today. I'll give you a quick science on science and emission, a quick update on the science and emissions. Uh, I'm going to talk about why the policies, as you'll see in the uh, slides, uh, have not been successful and are failing. And then I want to go off in a, a different direction. Uh, I'm sure many of you have heard much on one and two. I've skipped three and gone on to four, which is the potential contribution of artificial intelligence in this area. And that, that is something that we really haven't thought of very deeply, but uh, I've been struggling with, and I thought I'd share some thoughts with you. So the next slide will show you the um, some of the science, and this is up to date as of uh, November of 2023. And this, of course, is one of the, the most important historical monitoring of the atmosphere, the atmospheric sun, uh, carbon dioxide in, uh, in Hawaii. And this was a, started in 1950s and is uh, actually do, uh, done continuously. Uh, but basically, um, we think of it as monthly. And as you can see, uh, from a prehistoric level of a little under 300, uh, it has gone to about 420 now. Um, so that is that is um, more than more than halfway to a doubling of the CO2 concentrations. Uh, you can also see that it's rising more or less uh, exponentially, although it has some wiggles, has a seasonal pattern and some wiggles as well. So, um, but I want to talk about economics and the key, the, the key variable I look at on the next slide is the decarbonization of the of different economies. Uh, and so I'd like to show you on the next slide the trends in decarbonization. So this shows you the CO2 emissions, GO, GDP or output ratio for the world. Uh, and these are reasonably, reasonably good data now. They're uh, all of them have some measurement errors, but I think re relatively good data. And this is probably the most important uh, single measure of integrating economics and the environment because it shows you how energy intensive our output is. And it shows you on a ratio scale, uh, on a ratio scale, a straight line is a constant rate of growth or decline. Uh, and you can see in the blue dots, to a first approximation, uh, the, there has been a decarbonization in the global economy uh, a little more than a percent and a half a year since 1980. And there are many factors that lie behind this, uh, changing fuels, greater energy efficiency, movement from manufacturing to services, uh, but the trend is pretty clear. Uh, there may have been a, a slight increase in decarbonization from one minus 1.4 percent in the first three decades of this period, to minus 1.9 percent in the last 13 years, um, although it's it's just barely visible, I would say, in the data uh, that that break in trend. Um, but I'd say the best guess is we are decarbonizing between one and a half and two percent a year. 
Um, and that's that's good news, but the question is, is that good news enough? Um, and I'll show you on the next slide, but just the just to a first approximation, you can see it's not good enough because if the world economy is growing at 4% a year and we're de decarbonizing at 2% a year, that means CO2 emissions are growing at 2% a year. And so what this graph showed you, now we're gonna move a little further along. Uh, we're gonna, I'm gonna show you some projections. So we have recently, a colleague and I have recently uh, updated our um, integrated assessment model. It's called DICE for Dynamic Integrated Model of Climate and the Economy. Just think DICE though. DICE is a, a nice name and it, it kind of captures, captures the diciness of the enterprise, the casino aspects that Alex mentioned earlier. Uh, and what this graph shows you is from 2000 to 2022, uh, the global emissions of uh, of CO two, including including some uh, other other emissions, other greenhouse gases as well, and then uh, and you can see that's pretty much follows the trend. Well, this is total emissions, not divided by GDP. So when you see recessions, it goes down. When you see the pandemic because of the global downturn, it goes down. But uh, this is actual total emissions, which is is key. And then it shows three different paths. Uh, that you probably have in mind. Um, one is the Paris Accord, which is actually international policy at this point. It's it's uh, what was agreed to in the Paris Accord in 2015 and has been updated periodically. Uh, it will undoubtedly be updated in COP28, uh, although whether any additional measures will be taken is unclear at this point. Um, that's the middle line. The top line is our best guess in our modeling as to what happens at current policy. That's to say countries do not uh, meet their Paris Accords, but continue uh, business as usual, building coal plants, slow increase in uh, renewable energy, um, little increase in carbon prices or regulations. And then the bottom line in the green shows you the estimated path of CO2 emissions if you were to meet a two degree C target. And the key point, of course, is not a surprise to you, but that is a sharp discontinuity from history. And instead of growing at a, a couple of percent a year, you would have to start declining pretty rapidly in the near future. And to get to two degrees C, at some point, it's gonna to have to decline sharply uh, sooner or later. But this is a path which gets there in a least cost. So one key point I'd like to make is that even if you take current policy, the Paris Accord, uh, that's a kind of extended uh, uh, into the indefinite future, um, tight, uh, tightening gradually over time, according to the tightening that we've had since, uh, since 2015, even if you were to meet the objectives of the current and, and a, an extended Paris Accord, uh, you, you would not meet the, the emissions trajectory that you need for the two degree target. I'll show the exact temperature in a minute. Um, although you do a lot better than you would with with uh, with doing nothing with the baseline. Uh, the uh, the two degree target is very demanding, and um, we it's a it's aspirational. It's like a maybe a twenty five or thirty foot uh, vault, pole vault, uh, maybe a three minute mile. I don't know what the ana proper analogy is, uh, but it's it's very difficult. And so far we haven't been got very far, we are not very far along. So in the next, so these are the emissions where I'd like to do again, using our integrated model. Uh, and maybe I'll just take a minute to remind you or tell some of you who don't know what these models do, these dice type models do. Uh, and what they do is they, basically are an end-to-end -end computerized empirical model of the economy, of the emissions, of the temperatures, and then of impacts of climate change, linking all these different elements together. Uh, so this, for example, would be one output. If you take output and you take policy, three different policies, what emissions would look like. And then if you go to the next slide, we see the next slide, uh, then going further to the next module of CO2 concentrations and to temperature, this is what 
the temperature trajectories would look like uh, starting in 2020 and going out to 2100. And as you can see, they, they, uh, they pretty much follow the emissions path. The top path, which is the what we call the base path or the current policy path, is uh, reaches about three and a half degrees C from prehistoric. Uh, now the, the the Paris path does it does gets a little bit of the way, maybe a third of the way down to the two degree target, uh, around three degrees C by uh, twenty one hundred, and the um, two degrees C obviously caps at two degrees C. Um, I'll just back up a mention to say some of the target in the International Accord and the Paris Accord and in many other uh, aspirational other agreements was two degrees C. Uh, there was an aspiration, a further aspiration to try to limit it to 1.5 degrees C. Uh, as you see, if you look to the left there, uh, we are almost surely, almost surely uh, going to hit the 1.5 degrees C sometime later this decade. Um, so that's pretty much infeasible at this stage without either a deep depression or some kind of mir miraculous uh, technology or policy. Uh, but the two degree C is is actually feasible. It's it's one that we could do with uh, substantial um, and important policies. So the question is, how are we going to move from our baseline at the top uh, in the red to the two degree C or or, or either close to that, maybe two and a half degrees C, or even better, uh, what kind of policy we be needed. Well, we can see that they're not needed, but let's move to the next slide and, and I'll, I'll talk about the policies, why they're failing, and what are in a way what are needing, what is needed, and why what we've done so far is failing. So there are three different parts of a strategy, uh, both national, this would be for the United States, for, for Ireland as part of the EU, for China and other countries to undertake to actually meet these ambitious goals. I won't say this is all you need, but I'd say without, without these three, you're going to fail. So one is carbon pricing, to put a price on carbon dioxide emissions. And this should be harmonized across countries and across sectors. Uh, I think the EU is is the model of this. It's 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 not perfect model, but it's done a good job in this. And basically, the only region country in the world that has done this uh, and, and done this for a substantial period of time. Uh, but around the world, if you look, whereas we would need carbon prices in the say fifty to one hundred dollar a ton range. Uh, the global total now, the global average is about $3 a ton. So we're just far too low to meet our objectives. But part of the reason is that the architecture, the second point, the architecture of climate agreements is flawed uh, because the under the current procedures and the conferences of the parties, which is going on, you require unanimity. You require unanimity of everyone from United States and uh, China to to the smallest little Belize's and Vanatu's and other countries. And you can't really seriously think you're gonna have a global policy where there are winners and losers with unanimity in every country in the world. And what we need is more of a climate club, which we can come back to if you like. And then the third, which I think perhaps has not gotten enough recognition is governmental support for green R&D. It's far too low um, at the present time. It, it is, it's not been a priority. And I'll just give you as one example in the uh, the very the well discussed the Inf Inflation Reduction Act uh, in the United States last year, which had substantial support for climate policy. There was no general support for energy, green energy R and D. It just was not uh, on the radar screen. Uh, I will give you an example on the next slide to give you to show you what the numbers are, just give you some background on uh, different kinds of energy investment in R&D. If we could have the next slide. Uh, th this is just one picture, but this is from, this is gives energy investments and R&D in the international energy agency countries, which are basically, basically almost all the countries who uh, do R&D. Um, and if you look, we'll just go down from left to right. Uh, fossil investment, and this was in 2020, as I remember, 
2019, as I remember, was $730 billion. Low carbon investment was pretty substantial in that year at over a little over $400 billion. But then if we get down to energy R&D, energy R&D in this area was only $100 billion in all these countries. And if you looked at low carbon, so energy R&D includes everything, includes fossil investments, includes investment in, in appliances. But if you look at low carbon R&D, say of renewables and things like that, it was only 40, got only $40 billion of low carbon R&D in the entire IEA region. And of that, probably a fourth of that was simply automobiles. Uh, a fourth of that was probably renewables like wind and solar. So one of the things that you see is this is much, much too low. And this is the third of the, of the planks that are needed to have a successful climate policy. All right, so what I'd like to do in, in um, the minutes that remain is I'd like to talk about a new, what is not a new topic to you, but maybe a new topic in this area. Uh, and that is, and we'll show you in the next slide, uh, will artificial intelligence come to the rescue? So the first question I wanna ask is, what do economists think will be the contribution of, of artificial intelligence? Um, and I'll give you a result from the Booth survey. The Chicago Booth School um, has a, a, a panel of economic experts and they ask from time to time questions. And this one was asked earlier in this year, about six months ago, about what the role of AI would be on productivity growth. Really, they didn't ask it quite that way. But they, the question was the use of artificial intelligence in the next decade will lead to a substantial increase in growth rates of advanced economies in the two subsequent de decades. And they asked, there, there were approximately, I think, 80 answers. And this is what people said. Uh, roughly half the people didn't know, and roughly half the people agreed. Uh, there was 2% disagree. I think it was probably me. But um, this is this is what the, the landscape was. So as I looked at this, I said, wow, that's really something. I mean, I don't know quite what a substantial increase in growth rate is, but to think that artificial intelligence would lead to a substantial increase in growth rate is really quite an quite a uh, important finding. Now you always you don't know whether they really have thought about this carefully or whether they're experts. Uh, and the main thing you don't know is what is a substantial increase in growth rate. So for example, if the growth rate, um, the, let's say per capita GDP, per capita work, per worker GDP in the U.S. has been growing roughly 2% a year uh, and is projected to grow roughly 2% a year over the next uh, decades in, in long-term projections. Uh, what would a substantial increase be? So I didn't know, but it, apparently a lot of a substantial number of people who have an opinion uh, think it will be substantial. All right. So what I did was, uh, since I didn't really, uh, I was teaching a macroeconomics course this spring, and so I was curious about this because this is this is a pretty big deal for macroeconomics uh, after the low productivity we've had, if this is really going to lead to a substantial increase. So I, I went back to the booth panel and I re-asked the question to a small number of them. And I, I picked people who were experts in this area. There were two Nobel Prize winners, including uh, one who's an expert on, on productivity and robotics, and uh, one who's, and then the leading historian of productivity growth, and the former chief economist in the IMF, and a couple of other people who've uh, thought very, very deeply about this, and, uh, and asked them the question. Well, the first thing I got back when, I, so I, I had six respondents, and I'll show you the answer in a minute, but I just wanted to just point out one thing first. The first thing I noticed is they didn't understand the question. So they were, two of them didn't answer about 2033 to 2053, but over the next decade. Another one's had another kind of confusion. And then when one said, well, I thought you said the next decade, uh, that's really hard to answer. So let me get back to you. Another one said, I can't answer that question till you tell me what the projections look like. So finally, after I wheedled and cajoled, uh, I got answers, which I'm going to show you on the next slide from the six experts. What does it, so this is what substantial means. Now, let me first start on the left there. 
Uh, Goldman Sachs is the only place that's actually done this so far. They have a research team and they estimated, estimated that productivity growth would be 1.5% higher over the next decade. So right away, not in the not in the future when the, this, uh, this fruit tree has borne fruit, but right away, uh, which I went back and looked at that and that, that's just, that was just very poor research. It wasn't really research at all. It was just making a, making a splash. Okay. So if you look at the six experts, A, A through F, um, I asked them about their best, their, their average, the 25th percentile of where they thought it might be in the 75th percentile. So you can think of that. The, the, let's look at that final bar graph on the right. The green square is the best guess as to what they thought would happen. And that was about three tenths of a percent per year increase. And the so the lower level was zero and the higher level was around one and a third. So, uh, which actually seems a not implausible answer and not an implausible range, I would say. So it's 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 small. I don't know if 0.3% per year is substantial or not, but it's not trivial. Uh, it is not a revolution in a real sense, but it's it's a it's substantial, um, but there's a possibility it might be much, much higher according to, to these experts. Um, so what I'd like to do is ask now, what is the impact of this on climate change? So sort of go back to our original topic in the next slide. And I wanna ask, suppose that outcome, output grows much more rapidly over the coming decades, because of AI and technological improvements, what will happen? And particularly what will happen to greenhouse gas emissions and CO2 emissions? And for that, we need to know the direction or the bias of the technology and when it will, whether it will be energy intensive. That's the key question. But for example, if the rate of decarbonization doesn't change, then the rate of emissions is gonna grow then emissions, the emissions growth rate will be higher. Because so the question, the key question here, which has not really been thought of, I think at all in the energy area is what is the direction or bias? That's a technical term used among technologists, the bias of energy and tech of, of AI technological change. And the, the next slide could give you some, let me say, I don't know, but let me give you four thoughts about the direction. First, one important point is information is a very low carbon sector. If you look at the CO2 per unit of computation, dollar, dollar by dollar, or BTU per dollar, or of the information sector as recorded in the national income and product accounts, it's among the lowest carbon intensity of every sector. So if that sector just grows, if all we do is just, is the, the growth is just the growth of information. We're just producing more and more bits. And that's what that increase in, um, uh, we have more and more posts on X and we have more and more, more and more online newspapers and so on and so forth. Uh, and that's all it is. That's the growth and output. Then that's low carbon. And that will not be a big increase in emissions. But on the other hand, another example was, let's say, I think this is not implausible that you'll do things like robotic miners, that mining is a really dirty, dirty job. And let's say we have a lot of low cost, very high efficiency miners uh, mining coal and other things. Well, that's probably bad news. That's, that's probably making coal even cheaper and it might be other fossil fuels as well. So that would go the other direction. Then a third possibility is let's say that the AI is used for programming of energy efficient machines or, or just improving things, improving the use of existing capital, well, that might lead to low energy. But what if it leads to disinf growing disinformation and, and uh, lack of tr growing distrust and uh, the determinant and deterioration in the governing institutions and the breakup of C breakdown of CO2 treaties uh, and the so fond farewell to climate clubs. Uh, well, that's 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 not good news for global agreements. 
I'd say as I take all these together, I think probably um, it will be neutral with respect to energy and greenhouse gas emissions if you have rapid growth in output. But uh, I think the um, I think the crystal ball here is 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 very cloudy. But it's something worth thinking about seriously. I, th I think somebody who's thought about this and looked at where AI will will penetrate. Um, it could be very useful. I guess I'll just go back. I, I, I had one thought I forgot to make, which is where are robots? Where are robots actually employed now, you might ask? Well, the answer is they're employed, aside from our vacuum cleaners and things like that, where are industrial robots? They're mainly in manufacturing. And the largest single sector is in automobiles. So the robots that actually exist now are producing a piece of capital that's extremely energy intensive and CO2 intensive. So I think it's I think it's a not it's not a clear picture here. I think it's a really interesting picture. I think the the question of how big it will be is important, and the question of where it will be used is important. But the net impact seems to me is probably not positive with respect to climate change. All right, I think I'll leave you with the next slide just to. Uh, give you an idea of the vast uncertainties here. And then I'll wrap it up because that's what I'd like to tell you about. And thank you for listening. Thank you very much. And I, I, I suppose I'm just, just thinking about your your points there about AI and where you where you got to, which was kind of pop, you think possibly a neutral impact, um, taking all of those various layers and factors into account as best you can, and maybe that should be a source of relief um, to think that because I mean the the the, the potential negative impacts are considerable, as you say, the crystal ball is a bit cloudy, but at least if you're coming in neutral, I think we can. We could probably feel some element of relief on that, although for all the reasons that you've said, it's very hard to. I mean, this, that's actually the first treatment that I've seen of the impact of artificial intelligence on this whole agenda. So it's really interesting. Obviously, it's just an emerging area of thought because it's so hard to so hard to predict. Um, there's a lot of interest in the climate club, so we do want to ask you about that. Um, there's two or three questions in already um, about it. But do you want to say something? even in general, because of the day that's in it, as we say. So with this uncertainty, even as we thought things would finish by in or around the middle of today in Dubai, and they, we were hearing, I'm just keeping an eye on the phone here, we're, there's nothing There's nothing yet anyway, unless I've missed something in the last 10 minutes or 20 minutes since we started here. Do you want to, what's just your impressions today of COP28, just high level? Well, I think high level is I think it's it's part of a flawed architecture. I think it's I think you know it's great that we're getting together and talking. And it has made over the years it has made many contributions. I mean, if it, the conference of the parties is responsible for the Kyoto Protocol, which was the only international binding international agreement. Now it turns out it failed, and I think the reason it failed was actually one of the reasons that I thought about a climate club because you look at the structure of the of the Kyoto Protocol compared to other treaties and you see that this this treaty in retrospect it's clear and, and maybe in prospect but in retrospect it was clear that this was a, this was a flawed architecture because of the voluntary nature of it. Um, we have a lot better understanding. I mean I, I think the IPCC has done a, a fabulous job um, it's not part of the conference of the parties per se, but it's part of the international architecture. It's a it's a novel, a completely novel approach to to dealing with um, international problems. To have a scientific body that is a kind of international expert group, I I just can't say how important that is. Now it's not perfect like anything else. It's not perfect, and the science is much better than than the economics, for example. Um, so there are many things, but but with this so this architecture is good for getting scientists together. It's good for getting people to talk. It's probably good for getting monitoring. It's good for ideas, but the central purpose is if the, if the central purpose is to have strong climate policies that get us to our targets, 
two degree, a one and a half degree, even a two and a half degree C target, then it has not succeeded. And has not succeeded because of the structure of having every country, country in the world as a voluntary organization. It's the structure of international law today. It operates under the structure of international law today. That's the key point. International law today is made up of countries negotiating with other countries, like you and I, a contractor buy or sell a car, or you and I to buy and sell a house, uh, or a Turkish bazaar with a rug. So you can't do that for these complicated public goods issues because there are too many losers. There, there are some winners, but there are also some losers. And uh, a circumstance where these every country participates and it has to be anonymous is just a recipe for for success. And it, that's not that's that comes from political science. That doesn't come from economics or political or common sense. Mm. But, so I'd say I, it's done many things, but in terms of the key thing of getting an agreement that will get us to its goals, its own goals, it is not succeeding. To, to just two two questions occurred to me out of that, out of what you've just said. The first is that, of course, the broader context for international law generally and public international law has always been, you know, the the the, the extent to which there can be enforcement of international agreements has always been problematic. And I'm not just talking about in the area of climate. So we go right back through the decades where there can be international agreements come to countries come together perhaps typically after wars they set up institutions they agree on certain norms and standards and and indeed laws and they pass you know they, they pass they, they have agreements and treaties and um, which enter into public international law but then there's just inevitably there's there's a limit on the extent to which you can have enforcement there's it's not that there's no uh, um, possibility for enforcement but there are limits on the ability to enforce even agreements that are made solemnly by countries one with the other so it's just it's just not the same as for example where we have domestic laws where we have enforcement mechanisms and just as a general point that's just i think an observation that's it's just a truism and I suppose the second point kind of linked to that is, and this takes us into the area of the climate club. I know Al Gore was over in Dubai and he was talking also about the, I think, I don't know, I mean, I'm paraphrasing it, but, you know, about the, the broken cop system as well and just the inability, the inadequacy of it. And I think he was talking along the lines that you're talking about very similarly, if I'm right, about a climate club, about countries who want to go ahead and do really good things should do that. Um, and should make agreements and should forge ahead and not be drawn back by the the ones that don't want to make change. But isn't it a global phenomenon that can't really be solved by, you know, by a, by even a substantial number of countries coming together? Because it needs the whole, isn't the great attraction of COP is that it's 196 countries and no matter how weak the agreement is, in a sense, at least it's everybody in the room. Well, it's got a broad, broad and shallow. You could say broad and shallow versus narrow and deep. And I think that's a key issue. Um, I I think, so let me say a couple of, was there a question mark at that? <laughs> no, <laughs> there were just propositions I was putting out to you that I think are contextual maybe for some of the ideas that you have. And just wondering, you know, whether you think, whether you, well, I suppose I kind of put in the opposite argument here, or putting just querying whether a club of even of a large number of countries would be sufficient to address something that's actually global in yeah. nature. Well, first, I think the point you made to begin with about international law needs to be emphasized. I mean, I mean, maybe those of us who are steeped in international law and international agreements are kind of used to it. So, sort of like. Uh, we're used to winter, right? You know, we're used to the fact that there's no sunlight a lot of the time in the winter. And uh, okay, so we're not going to say, did you ever notice that the days are short in winter? Wow. But actually, I think the but outside the people who are, are familiar with this, it, it's a really important point that international law is completely different from domestic law. Domestic law is by its very nature sort of within certain constitutional limits and, and limits of of uh, enforceability uh, has the ability to to pass laws that coerce the, the and enforce certain laws and regulations taxes whatever on the population that is not possible globally under the what I call the Westphalian system of 
1648, each country is sovereign and independent, and you cannot, under international law, force countries to do things without their consent. Under law, now it doesn't mean you can't use force to do it, but that doesn't seem like a very good way to solve this problem. Uh, so what you need is institute, you need institutions or mechanisms or incentives to get to uh, harness this strange system, voluntary system. Now, I think that's the first thing. And, and I think that unanimity, unanimity can work in certain circumstances. It can work for treaties, say there are coordination treaties. For example, what language should air traffic controllers use? If every air traffic controller used its local language, you would have a lot of crashes. So pick a language. What is a time zone? Let's all agree on the same time zones. Those are coordination treaties, and those are relatively simple. But treaties which, or agreements which require, which have uh, winners and losers are more complicated. And there are two examples. Uh, one is a, a relatively narrow treaty, which is the World Trade Organization, where countries agree to certain restrictions on, them, on themselves with respect to taking uh, uh, protectionist actions. Uh, they have certain bindings, as it's called in international trade law, that they won't raise their tariffs or do different things. But it, it has enforcement mechanisms where countries, other countries can retaliate if they do. Uh, so there's, there's, it's not just an agreement, but it's an agreement where there's agreed penalties for people who deviate from the rules. And that's actually the, that's actually the model for the climate club would be the World Trade Organization. A much deeper treaty would be the EU itself, where, uh, which has got a, a whole set of different uh, rules and treaties. Um, and what's interesting about the EU, the EU is a climate club. The EU has policies and not every country, I, I don't need to tell you, not every country in the EU agrees that these strong targets that uh, are, are, are being proposed and being implemented, but being part of the club means, okay, it's, it's, you want to be in the club, you want, you want to be able to trade, you want to have free, uh, you want to have market access, you want to have free movement of goods and, and people, then this is part of the cost of the deal. All right, the cost of that. Uh, so that that so I think what I use in my thing was you have to take as a given that you can't you can't you can't develop deep and costly international agreements without some mechanism. Uh, we know we know that time and time again from the history of international treaties, but there are some models that we can look at. Because if we don't have them, if you, if you look back 20 years, if you 20 years ago, you say this is going to fail. I mean, some people said that 20 years ago, this is going to fail. The COP mechanism is going to fail because it's it requires unanimity or it requires countries to join who don't want to join, like the oil oil exporters. You, you probably, I don't know, maybe I said that 20 years ago, I don't remember, but uh, other people did. And now you have you have to overcome that. And so I think... The intellectual challenge here, but it all, I think first it's an intellectual challenge to, to think about that. But then once that problem has been posed, then it's a diplomatic and political challenge to see how to implement it. And again, there are there are very there are many, many wrecks along this this road, but there are also a few successes. And uh, that's what I'd point to. Interesting, very interesting. So we, we've got some great questions coming in. Um, and if you have, if you are watching and listening and you'd like to ask a question, please do use the Q&A function. Uh, we like you to tell us um, if you have a designation, you know, if you're representing an organization, um, if you think of that when you're putting in your questions. So uh, Keen Donaghy thanks you very much for your presentation and congratulates us for hosting a rock star of climate economics. Yeah. And he, he does a number of other things. I'm just going to shorten his question as I read it. But it's basically, do you feel real climate action can be driven by carbon border adjustment mechanisms or CBAMs, or could that lead to trade wars and or apathy? Um, all three. I think the answer is all three. Um, the... the um, just coming back to the point I was making earlier about the success of the World Trade Organization, which is as a retaliatory measure, uh, country, when countries, um, say the U.S. puts, during the Trump administration, puts tariffs on washing machines or whatever, then the other country can retaliate. That's fair game. on that. That's part of the treaty. 
uh, and it's got to be in a particular way, temporary degressive, and so on and so forth. Um, so uh, that would be part of it. But the problem is, I think what I worry a little bit about is that this is this is cart. I don't know if it's cart before horse. We don't have a horse yet. We don't have an international agreement. And so I think what you need to do is put the environmental proposals first and say, this is what we would expect. So in, in my own thing, I, I, you could either do it the Kyoto style of emissions reductions, but I think that's very, very complicated. The simplest way to do it would be to have an expectation that country have a minimum domestic carbon price, say $50 a ton. And if a country meets that, then it passes the hurdle. If a country doesn't meet that, then it qualifies for some kind of penalty from the group in the club. But it has to be some standard. It has to be some mechanism for measurement, for determination. In the same way WTO, their expert, or the, or the, the, the Canada-US uh, international trade agreements, there's a mechanism for, for measuring these things and for determining it, not just you don't you think this country hasn't done it, slap on a tariff on steel. And the other thing, it's it's it, these are very narrow. They're really not, they don't get at the problem, which is the carbon intensity and the and the carbon carbon pricing in a country as a whole. The main thing that's missed by the current proposals to put tariffs on imports is that it misses domestic production of carbon. For example, Almost all of electricity production is not exported. I'm sorry. Very little of electricity production is exported in most countries. Leave, leave aside Europe, United States, uh, Mexico, China, India, almost. So any carbon dioxide emissions that come elect from electricity production would simply be exempted from this, from these uh, border tax adjustments because they're not embodied, they're not part of uh, exports. So what we need is a broader measure as well. But I think as these have to be part of an agreement and they have to be part of an international agreement and uh, of, of countries that see this as a very, very serious future problem, want to find a mechanism to do it, realize a mechanism is not going to exist unless there are strong incentives. And, you know, this is just one of many incentives, but it's a, it's a pretty good one. So I've got some questions, which we'll do. We'll probably do them a little bit more quick fire if it, if it, if it okay. works. Frank Barry, what are your thoughts on the global distribution of carbon tax revenues? Oh, that's very simple. All carbon tax revenues should go to the country where they originate. Okay. Noel Cahill, is 4% global economic growth consistent with the two degree warming target? Um, well, uh, yes. That I would say yes, but only in the presence of very uh, ambitious carbon pricing, universal carbon pricing or near universal carbon pricing, and very um, much, very very much larger uh, support of green energy R&D. So it's not that itself is infeasible, but it, it just means we have a little more uh, work to do in our carbon pricing. Okay. John Fitzgerald, how much difference does the changing attitude of China to the urgency of climate action make? How much difference did that make? Well, I, I do think that um, I do think that the political, the international political atmosphere has deteriorated pretty seriously over the last decade or more i mean we have we have two hot wars going on right now uh very destructive and very divisive wars we have a cold war going on between the us and china um we have a very destructive past president who's threatening to become again president of the united states which is going to be bad for just about everything i could think of so I would say the international um, the international scene is is currently not looking very very propitious for climate agreements. Hadrian Bazine is um, the EU policy advisor for Credit Agricole, and the question two questions actually a general one: How personally confident are you in humanity's capacity to face climate change? 
How do you view the world 50 years on? So that's back to your um, crystal ball. And the second question is, what is your view on climate's impact on financial stability and the best ways to mitigate it? Do you recommend adopting the prudential framework? Well, on the first question, I'm, I have no doubt that humans have the capacity to do this. Humans have the capacity for many wonderful things, and they have done them in the past. The question is whether our institutions, the institution that we as humans have constructed, have the capacity. And I, I think the confidence of the party structure is not going to do it. Uh, and I think the current the current political arena, international political arena is not favorable, but I, there's no doubt that we have the capability of done. We've done many important things over the, over the, the, the let's say millennia. And the second one on financial stability. Uh, well, I, I, I think I'm, I think the central banks, of, I don't know if this is a green central banking question, maybe it is, but the question is, should central banks take this on? Uh, I think the central banks of the world have a lot on their hands right now. Uh, getting inflation under control in the near term, fighting the next recession. Uh, they don't have the tools and actually don't have the expertise to deal with climate change. So I think they can be supportive. They also always should keep their eye on financial stability issues. I don't see this as a major financial stability issue in the near term, but I might be wrong. So I would say this is on the list, but not very high on the list. Liam McCartan says, so what is the answer to your question? Can we exit the climate casino? I think I just and, answered that. Yes, we can. Yes. And if yes, yeah, how? Well, you mentioned. <laughs> yes. Detail. Whether yeah. we will or not, we can, yeah. yes. Whether we will not, but, you know, we, we've made progress. Uh, we're, we're, you know, if your target is one and a half degrees, you probably ought to find something else to work on. If your target is two degrees, work harder. If your target is three degrees, you have a pretty good chance. So mm -hmm. uh, it, it, mm. if you're, if it kind of depends what your aspirations are. Yeah. Alexandra Perfilova in UCD um, says, could you please give an example of how AI might influence decarbonization with respect to the power industry? Might AI be supportive um, of zero carbon power generation? Yeah, I thought about for this. I, I actually, I don't have a good answer. Uh, I have some small answers. Uh, for example, just Doing dispatch of, of low of green electricity. Um, that's a that's a very complicated high tech area. Uh, doing energy price electricity pricing. That's really complicated. So some some of the some of the technical issues, but those aren't going to those 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 aren't going to get you very far in terms. Of, if you if you have eighty percent of your electricity produced by fossil fuels, that's not going to get you to zero carbon very quickly, or at all actually. So Andy Fanning of the EPA, we heard from Andy earlier, um, pops in a question, what needs to happen to bring carbon pricing to a level where it will be an effective driver? Well, I think the main the main thing would be some kind of um, cli international climate agreement that set that as a standard. Um, and and uh, let me just make a general, if I might, just a general point here. You, you need to, you, your policy agreements need to be about policies as much as, as objectives. So if all the central banks of the world say 2% inflation, but they don't say anything about how to get there. So we're just going to set up and say 2% inflation, and we don't have the tools to get there. It's not going to do much good. What we need to do is not only have targets, but we need to have policies. So what needs to be more focused on is the policies, and particularly the policies that I mentioned, high carbon prices, subsidies, bigger subsidies for green uh, green innovation energy innovation so i think i think more attention to the policies as part of our international structure and, and the prices as part of international structure is what we need you were you were i thought you were less than enthusiastic about the um inflation Re reduction act in your opening remarks or at least about the adequacy of a lot of the measures in there um on some, on one view, some analysts have seen it as a really very radical step forward, and almost sort of has been compared to kind of New Deal, and it's it's big state intervention is is back, and you know um, that it's that is a very welcome uh, intervention by by the state in 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 this huge agenda. I mean, uh, just 
just in principle do you, do you do you even if you think it's not adequate but you do you think in principle it's it's been the right thing to do is this you alex <laughs> it's me sorry okay. it is yeah no it's okay it is. i thought it was I just part. Like, um well i i'm not i'm not i'm not uh, i'm I have some reservations. Hmm. One reservation is what I think of the three key policies it was silent on. It was silent on carbon pricing, it was silent on international agreements, and it was silent and it was silent on on gen, generalized basic research in energy. So that that's a kind of negative. Now in terms of what it actually did um I I'll just say one thing it focused a little too heavily for my taste on production subsidies rather than upstream technology and research subsidies. So in particular areas that it wanted to subsidize like wind wind and, and uh, solar and EVs. Um, and I think that's, that, that's probably not, that, that's, I don't think that's the right way to think of it. I think the right way to do is not to subsidize bicycles, but to tax carbon. And so it, it has, a, I think, the wrong mindset. Now, having said that, uh, if you look at a Congress that hasn't done anything, and you say any step forward is, any step is a step forward. And so that's one way to think of it. But I think in terms of role models or models for how to deal with climate change, it was, uh, I was less than enthusiastic, yes. Do you think, and this is me again, do you think if there ever were, were to be a climate club along the lines that you've explained is necessary, what what are the what are the politics of the US being in that club or likely to be in that club? And that's a, as a very generalized question. Well, I, that's a really good question. I think the US um, uh, is very jealous of its sovereignty. And so it's only going to join such a, and it's, it's turned down many, many uh, treaties over the years, um, uh, as, as you all know. Um, I think first place it would have, it would require a significant realignment of US politics away from the, the, the conservative opponents and uh, which, which happens from time to time. So it, it would requ require alignment. And then will require a, a recognition that some uh, some international agreement would be necessary. I mean, if you think of it, the U.S. has joined many international agreements. Uh, many of them are ones that it uh, it sponsored itself, the UN, the the four great international institutions, IMF, World Bank, and so on and so forth, and World Trade Organization. So uh, I think in a way it has to, from a U.S. political point of view, it would be very helpful if it originated from the United States, but that's going to require uh, you know, people like Al Gore who who are willing to do it. I've just had one thing. I think one of the big, I was a very, very big admirer of Barack Obama. Mm -hmm. And I think he knew all about this. But I think one of my big disappointments is that in all his speeches on climate, he never mentioned carbon pricing. He didn't mm -hmm. mention that as an important policy. He was all in favor of cap and trade and so on. But he actually didn't get it. And he knew that the point of cap and trade was to get the carbon prices up, but he never said it. So the educational platform that he, the ability to, to influence opinion, uh, he didn't exercise. And this is one area where, as a result, we're, we're still a long way behind. Hmm. Thank you. We have a number of other questions. We did have a question earlier on, early on from Anthony Brogan, who had a, a, a perhaps a somewhat detailed question to come to at the end of the hour. But he mentioned that the University of Exeter released a major climate tipping points report at COP28 last week. And he's wondering how can economists quantify the potential climate losses from catastrophic catastrophic tipping points like the collapse of the AMOC, you know, the Atlantic um, Meridional Overturning Circulation, that includes the Gulf Stream. Like, how can the economists uh, uh, um, map that or quantify that, um, given that it's something that COPs have failed to address up to now? I'm sorry, it's sort of introducing a slightly new agenda point, but he did take the trouble, Anthony did, to ask that question. I wonder if you have a thought on it. I do. I thought I thought a lot about tipping points. First place, we first need to have the science clear. We need we need to have a clear understanding of 
what will lead to certain tipping points. For example, what will what climate trajectories will lead to reversal of the, uh, the North Atlantic deep water circulation on what time frame with what probability distribution? Uh, that's question number one. Or a second one I'll I'll talk about is the Greenland ice sheet. What's the trajectory? Uh, for the melting of the Greenland ice sheet, and is it reversible? So all the tipping points that are mentioned in, the, in this very, very interesting and important literature, they, the first stage is the scientists need to inform the downstream analysts what is the physics, the geophysics of this. Okay, then once that is done, I think it's it's a it's a manageable project. Most of these have actually been analyzed in the economic in the integrated assessment literature. And I'll just mention one which I did, which was an analysis of the Greenland ice sheet. It was an integrated assessment, integrating policy, uh, uh, the tipping point in the Greenland ice sheet, the irreversibility of the ice sheet, what would needed to be done over what time frame. Uh, so the, these these are issues that can be addressed, and in some cases have been addressed. Um, and uh, it, I think it, with with maybe the one exception of the West Antarctic ice sheet, which may already be beyond the, the tipping the uh, key tipping point most of these are either reversible or ones that have not reached the irreversible tipping point um, so i think that this this is this is important work this is work that is underway there's already there was a paper by uh, tom Dietz. Uh, not tom uh, um, i'm sorry i forgot his first name uh, yeah. um who, I, I think I know who you're referring to as well, but it's not coming to me either. So yeah, and uh, on tipping points, which was a pretty good survey. So um, EPA actually had a really good event uh, on that um, uh, yeah. within the last year as well. Here, the EPA here in Ireland had a great speaker on that here um, some time back. So yes. look, good. most interesting, and it just serves to illustrate the, if I may say so, sheer breadth of your knowledge and understanding of these issues not just from the point of view of economics but obviously the science too and the international law and the governance and all of the politics of this all sort of uh, rolled up uh, together yeah si simon deets simon deets simon deets i'm sorry Ian, yes that wasn't me that wasn't my quick moment that was one of our um people watching keen donahy uh, has just uh, shot that in here it was so. a great it was a great paper on tipping points yeah terrific yes. Um, listen, thank you so much for your time. Once again, I, I want to uh, express our appreciation um, for having you with us here, both on our behalf in the Institute and the EPA and all of our viewers and, and, and listeners, if I can call them such, who are still with us uh, through this really interesting and fascinating hour. And there's so much more that we could talk about. Um, you've given us more food for thought. Um, you haven't said an awful lot about COP. It's almost like today because it's almost like as if your expectations are not that high of what's going to happen today. So I think that's you've eloquently made the point that that, that system looks like it's broken. Um, and whatever comes out of today is is not going to be anything like the last word anyway. So um, I don't know if you want to have another last word, um, but it's it's my pleasure to thank you for having been with us for this hour and for your presentation and for answering those questions and observations. Well, I, I would say I very much enjoyed today. I want to say about Q&A sessions, uh, sessions where half of it I talk and half of it I listen. I don't learn anything when I talk, but I learn many things from questions. And I really like the sessions with the Q&A. So to you, Alex, and to the many people who've asked these very interesting questions and difficult questions. I, I'm very grateful. And it's really been a real pleasure to be with you again. Thank you very much. And I really do hope we'll see you again at some point in the future.